To get going, I welcome um, Professor Freimuth, Rector of the University of Cologne, who will talk to us first of all. Um, still in the aftermath of Corona, uh, our time schedules are a little bit mixed up, so unfortunately, Professor Freimuth has to open two events this evening, which came to fall together due to corona delays. So I welcome Professor Freimuth, who will now open the conference. In fact, we're quite happy to have two such events, but it doesn't make things easier, actually, in organizations. So, dear Professor Hammer, dear Professor Bollich, Dear members of the Global South Study Center, dear speakers and panelists, dear friends and colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Rectorate of the University of Cologne, I would like to welcome you to the European Conference on African Studies. This conference is held under the theme of African Futures. As the conveners made clear in their thematic statement, Africa's future cannot be separated from that of the rest of the world, or in other words, the continent is perceived as an experimental field for global tomorrows. However, in spite of decades of globalization, both as political and economic reality and as subject of academic debates, society somehow tends to ignore how closely linked our continents have become. In order to address this shortcoming, the University of Cologne founded in 2014 the Global South Studies Center, actually already at that time based on a, a, a variety of activities and research in this field. The center, which is about 60 members today, brings research expertise together in relation to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, promoting interdisciplinary cooperation among leading researchers in Germany and internationally. The Global South Study Center scientists conduct research on social, economic, political, and cultural change across countries of the Global South in general and the African continent in particular. This may include topics on a broad scale, from decolonization studies to environmental protection to ethnographic research. Affiliated projects and centers include, just to name a few, a collaborative research center named Future Rural Africa, uh, Future Making and Social Ecological Transformation, which is a long-term research project funded from the German Science Foundation. Rewilding the Anthropocene, a project funded by the European Research Council that is dealing with the people, flora, and fauna in the world's largest conservation landscape, which is located in southern Africa. The African Climate and Environment Center, Future African Savannas, which is one of four global climate and environment centers funded by the German Academic Exchange Service. A competence center, Fair Trade, aiming to promote research on fair trade in German-speaking countries, or a research group, Cross-Border Mobility and Institutional Dynamics, together with the University of Siegen. As you can see, the Global South is an important part of the University of Cologne's research profile. We hope to expand this area even more in the upcoming round of the German Excellence Strategy Funding Competition. By the way, the deadline for submission of draft proposals is today. So if some of the colleagues from Cologne seem a bit overtired during the conference, you can guess why but somehow they have mastered the double burden of writing excellent proposals, hopefully successful, and organizing this large-scale conference. And I think this is really worth of a big round of applause. In connection with our research profile, I would like to emphasize that many of our activities are carried out in cross-continental cooperation. The Global South Study Center has a strong network of African researchers, and as a university, we strive to further develop such networks. For example, I'm very pleased that in July, the University of Cologne will open a regional office in Accra in Ghana. Like the existing offices of our university in New York, New Delhi, Beijing, and Cairo, our fifth office will serve as a central point of contact for researchers and students from both regions providing support, coordination, and opportunities for collaboration. 
I am sure that this will strengthen our academic links with universities in Ghana and beyond. I'm very happy that the university can not only rely on an international network, but also on excellent cooperation at the local level. Specifically, the city of Cologne, in cooperation with the Global South Studies Center, has taken this conference as an opportunity to organize a program for citizens, African futures all around. This program aims to bring essential social, political, and um, artistic aspects of the African continent into the focus of the wider public. I'm very pleased that our scientific conference has provided the impetus for this civic program, and I would like to thank the City of Cologne for its commitment to realize this timely and important public science initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, against this background, let me conclude with a quotation from a former mayor of the city of Cologne, who later became German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. Four years ago, in 2019, the University of Cologne celebrated the 100th anniversary of its re-foundation. Actually, it was first time founded in 1388, then refounded in 2019. Um, this was, the letter was an initiative of the citizens of the city in Cologne. On this occasion, Konrad Adenauer gave a speech in which he defined it as a key mission of the new University of Cologne to show that between all European people, there is after all much more in common than in separation. Crises such as Brexit, or most recently the war in Ukraine, make us painfully aware that we need to make further efforts to achieve this goal. And, a visit, and if, if that was not enough, we cannot just focus on dismantling borders within Europe if it, that means at the same time erecting new borders on the edges of Europe. In contrast, rather, we need to think globally and put Adenauer's words in perspective. We have so much more in common with the peoples of Africa, Asia, America, and Australia than in separation. Ladies and gentlemen, a heartfelt thank you to the organizers of today's event, the speakers, and especially you, the audience. I wish you all an interesting conference with fruitful discussions, and thank a lot for your uh, attention. And I apologize, apologize that I now have to go to the City Hall of Cologne to open the other conference that we have today. So thank you very much. to everybody. I'm a bit lower in the pecking order, so I don't get introduced. I have to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Amanda Hammer. I am the president of the European African Studies Association. It is called Aegis. We've sort of done away with the very long-winded way, which is the Africa-Europe Group for Interdisciplinary Studies. We don't really talk about that anymore. We just talk about Aegis. We are the brand, European African Studies. So. I speak to you on behalf of the board and the plenary to very, very warmly welcome you to ECAS 2023, which is the ninth ECAS conference since 2005. So there have been nine, there ought to have been 10, but in 2021 we missed one because of COVID. Uh, it caused a lot of, you know, raucous and upset, of course, for everybody in the world, but also for the organizers who had to readjust, and as we see, uh, Professor Feimort is rushing. We, we actually should be very impressed that he didn't mix up his speeches <laughs> from going from one to the other. So I am wearing the hat of the president of Aegis. Actually, it seems that for many people, <laughs> many people don't actually know that ECAS falls under the European African Studies Association umbrella. Um, if you are still around on Saturday, when we have a closing speech, I get 15 minutes instead of five, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Aegis, and I'd like to encourage you to also look at our very new, recently launched website, new website. Um, so I won't go into what it is, but um, 
we, the ECAS is our real flagship event every second year, but there are so many other things that come under Aegis, and we have membership, only institutional membership, but many of you are part of those institutions without really knowing that you're connected to Aegis in this very important way. So more of that another time. But before turning my attention to you, back to you, I want to be bold enough to speak on behalf of all of you right now in expressing our collective appreciation, especially to the team of committed, generous, incredibly hardworking people who have put together, and for the next four days hold together, the multiple elements of this conference that includes the extensive academic, technical, creative, administrative, practical labor, I would also probably like to add emotional labor, much of it voluntary, not the, not the emotional stuff, that has gone into generating a truly an amazing program and ensuring that around 2,000 of us could gather here and be productively engaged for these four days. I'd especially like to recognize the local organizing team, in particular Michael Bollig, Clemens Greiner, Martina Gockfell, in Cologne, Stephen van Wolpeter from Leuven, who is a partner with, with Cologne, the whole Nomad team, the many student volunteers, um, as well as other technicians, creatives, caretakers, cleaners, visible and invisible, we are all incredibly grateful beneficiaries of your labor. So please let's appreciate. And of course, we are extremely grateful to the University of Cologne. We understand very much from Professor Freimuth, uh, the rector, what it means to the University of, of Cologne. And I think it's a real, not just that the university agreed to you know, ho hold this in, in its spaces and, and with the staff and so on, but it's not entirely common across all our universities that there is that level of consciousness, support, um, inclusiveness, and I think that and some other universities are, are important models for the rest of us, whether it's in Europe or elsewhere on the continent, to really think about how do we expand understandings, connectivities, inclusivities, consciousness about what Africa means in our lives, in our worlds, etc. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to have heard I do not think of those as just like um, empty words. I, I mean, it's a real um, manifestation of just being here that, there is the, that there's that kind of commitment and I think we should all take some inspiration from it. But now let me turn back to all of you, or shall I say all of us. And I think about us as truly a multitude, a multitude of minds and hearts meeting to exchange ideas and the fruits of so much intellectual work face to face at last. We've, we've not been able to do that. A multitude of faces crinkling up with curiosity and questions and brightened by exciting d discoveries and, and, and uh, learning. We are collectively a multiplicity of differences coming together to explore and challenge in each other and ourselves what we know or think we know, and how we think, from, in, and about African realities, imaginings, possibilities, in their immense variation. As we know, this year's conference theme is African Futures, in their multiplicities, and as Professor Freimott also recognized, clearly African Futures are simultaneously everyone's futures, and African Futuring this active term coined by the conference volume, published by the Aegis Brill series, African futuring is profoundly linked to everyone's futuring, albeit in complicated and uneven ways that require our keen attention. And many of the, I mean, the, the sort of program and the panels and the titles are bringing all of the many dimensions to our attention in a very exciting way. So undoubtedly, <laughs> Undoubtedly, we are all connected over time, but connected locally and globally in ways that undoubtedly are painfully shadowed 
by violent pasts and continuing presence, but at the same time, our connections are also potentially shaped positively by the critical consciousness generated through mutual openness, curiosity, integrity, and solidarity. As I see it, African study spaces are, provide among the most productive opportunities for questioning and transforming the nature of such connections. So speaking not only as the president of Aegis, but as a Zimbabwean based in Europe, a scholar, a feminist, and absolutely an African studies activist, I see ECAS as precisely the kind of space in which such transformative possibilities can do and must flourish. In that, I wish for us all, this rich multitude that we are, a truly uplifting conference in which we both honor and are enriched by such possibilities. So have a fabulous conference. Thanks. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it has taken a while for this conference to take place. When we parted after an inspiring and very well organized ECAS 8 conference in Edinburgh in summer 2019, little did we know that it would be a full four years until we would meet again in person. Originally scheduled for the summer of uh, 21, the coronavirus pandemic forced us to postpone ECAS 9 for two years. The decision taken early on proved to be the right one. In the summer of uh, 21, we had a final online term here at the University of Cologne after another wave of the pandemic in late spring that year. At the University of Cologne, we only returned back to classroom teaching in autumn 21. This evening, we welcome about 1,500 conference participants. In the end, there will be more than 2,000 participants. We welcome them in person. We are certain that discussions, even if controversial, around a table or in a classroom, will provide more of a platform for personal, creative exchanges than any Zoom, WebEx, or Teams platform can. Certainly, it is not only planned uh, academic discussions that will provide space for thought. Personal encounters involving coffees, beers, well, that's too many drugs, sparkling water and still water, and also music, will add to the experience of a shared academic identity. Today, the health situation has improved and COVID is no longer regarded as a global threat. Infections have become routine and have added to the complexity of our daily lives. The horrors of the pandemic, however, have given way to new global challenges. The war in Ukraine, violence and xenophobia in a number of other countries, and a serious drought situation in parts of Eastern Africa condemning millions of people to famine. These challenges add to the complexity of a world that is characterized by increasing inequalities, newly invigorated nationalisms and phobias. Certainly, we should not and will not rest content with only an analysis, an academic analysis of the trouble. It is the prerogative of the social scientists and humanities scholars to consider future making and to consider and emphasize that, and here I quote from the volume, that there is no single future, as the, this volume to the conference um, argues in its introduction. The introduction continues and emphasizes that there are many roads to take, many paths to follow, each of which comes with its own crossroads and junctions its own uncertainties, expectations, anxieties, 
imaginings, anticipations and speculations, determined and undetermined by pasts and presents, by possibilities and constraints, by past futures and by future pasts. The conference's 244 panels and roundtables, and it's about 1,400 papers read by about 2,000 delegates, out of which 550, roughly speaking, come from the African continent, reflect on these challenges. In many panels, though innovative approaches to global environmental challenges, resistances to failures in political participation, and creative understandings of challenging social, ecological, and cultural dynamics are prominent. Dear colleagues, I'm personally looking forward to presentations from different scientific vantage points and um, to intensive discussions on futures and the making of futures, both in past and in the present. I'm looking forward now to our first round table, and we decidedly started decided to start the conference with a round table and not with a lecture so that we right away get into discussions and in engagements with the audience. Thanks for listening. Before I start, I'm just going to quickly see if I can see everyone equally. Can every one of my panelists see me properly? Good, good, all right, great. This is such a packed room, I did not expect that. So first of all, welcome. Welcome to a very sunny day in Cologne. I just arrived today from Berlin. My name is Shannon, Shannon Bobinger, and I actually think it is a privilege when someone has the opportunity to introduce themselves. So do not worry, at least that's my perspective on it. Therefore, you can get it right, and everyone else also can get the latest version of yourself. Therefore, yes, I am for speaking for myself on my own behalf, and um, on that matter, I will also empower my panelists to introduce themselves in a minute. But before we get to that, um, I'm wearing different hats today. I'm a moderator, host, um, I'm a systemic coach, and I am a speaker on political issues such as critical whiteness, ding, 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 ding. And the empowerment of marginalized groups. We are set in Germany, and therefore, I think it's very fair to be transparent about the fact that the format that we are today speaking in is very Eurocentric, right? The fact that we are restricted by a very small time frame to discuss an incredibly complex topic that in itself could be a study, right? We could sit here and philosophize about that question. Is there a future for African studies in Europe for at least a semester? <laughs> at least, I think. So with all that being said, bear with us. We have great minds on this panel and I'm really happy about all these different perspectives that you will get to hear, not only to hear, but you will also get the chance to ask questions. And when you do, make sure they are questions. <laughs> okay? Because we don't have time. Um, no, just to make sure that we all get to speak and to exchange and to have an idea because we don't only want to have this discussion on this bubble on our stage, but we very much would like to get an idea of what are the questions that we have in the audience, what is the room looking like, because we're talking about participation, we're talking about inclusion, and it needs all these different perspectives in order to really also be inclusive, doesn't it? 
I feel like we could all just to waken up the energy, give ourselves a round of applause for this great setting we're in today. We have a lot that we want to dive into today, and therefore I also want to maybe create some sort of expectation management that today is a day where we get to dive into the different ideas, different perspectives on said question, and ideally leave you with some impulses, right? Because the topic in itself can be quite difficult, challenging, Right, And there's only so much we can get to do within 90 minutes, but we want to make that time count and therefore without further ado, I would like for you to once again welcome my great panelists. They are from all over the world and I'm extremely excited and I feel like I'm going to learn quite a lot myself. So please give a warm applause to Divine Fu. And since you've been clapping with us, make sure you raise your hands so everyone knows who you are. <laughs> right. Then we have Faiza Gava. Please give it up for Faiza. <laughs> then we have Ndapewa Feni Nakanietse. <laughs> we have Jonathan Nge. <laughs> and we have Star. Yeni and Charleston Thomas. As I said earlier, I strongly believe in speaking for oneself. So if we can maybe in um, the reverse order, if you would please tell the audience who are you and with which hat are you here today? What perspective uh, brings you here today? Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I am Charleston Thomas from Tobago. That's one of the islands in Trinidad and Tobago, a twin island country in the Caribbean. Um, I'm normally mistaken for Jamaican, so I'm correcting that now. I'm Tobagonian. Um, I am a musician, I'm a writer, um, but I'm also a liver. I live. All right. Um, Cheers so to I'm, that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm here to live. I'm live with you, you know, live among you for while I'm here. Um, I'm not sure which hat I'm wearing. Um, I'm not sure which hat there is to be worn, but um, I think I'll be quite fine. Um, I think you'll be fine. So, yeah, let's just talk. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Star. I'm from South Africa. I live in Cape Town. Um, I'm, I'm many things. Oh, well, I'm also not sure which hat, so maybe let me just go with the flow. Um, but I'm currently writing up my PhD. Um, I work on land and agrarian issues um, in South Africa. Uh, but otherwise, I'm also an activist and have for many years before deciding to torture myself by doing a PhD. Um, I've been working as, a, as an activist, working with social movements across South Africa and in the region for at least 15 years uh, on, on, on the land question. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> I'm Feni Nagañete. I am actually, I know what, what hat I'm wearing today. I must say, I am here as a student and as a, a village girl who came from Ohangwena region in Namibia and as an African traveler who is very passionate about traveling Africa and learning from the people in the continent. And besides that, I do also travel out. Um, um, I haven't been to the Caribbean yet, but I would at 
one point. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan once more. I am a Cameroonian. I was born and raised in Cameroon. Did uh, most of my studies there. But then I also studied in uh, Northern Europe, in Sweden, particularly. And I have done some research in Sweden, in Cameroon, and also in the United Arab Emirates. So my background is in sociology and anthropology. And, and, and the other things, there are many other things that as we interact, maybe we find out more about each other. Thank you. Yeah, good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you to uh, ICAS and the University of Cullen for hosting us uh, and for seeing so many people. Uh, when I accepted to do this, I didn't know it would be such a big hall. Uh, but I, I, I am based at the University of Cape Town, and I'm heading the Institute for Humanities. Uh, and I'm very passionate about the continent and working to build the continent, to build new knowledge, also to center the continent in global thinking, in thinking about a new humanity. And I think I'm here as a friend to hang out with crews and also to really create a space for networking so that we can move forward with uh, uh, this Africa as, you know, as a concept to take us to the next phase of humanity. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Faisal Gerba. I teach sociology at the University of Cape Town. Uh, unlike Divine, I used to teach a first year introduction to sociology class. For three years, I did that course. And on average, we had 980 students. So when I got into this hall, you know, I had a little bit of a traumatic drawback. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but, but I'm, happy, I'm happy to be here, and I, I hope the, the conversation will be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let us, yeah, let us directly dive in and... I feel this conversation, we cannot start without really addressing the actual question. And maybe just, if you can give me a hand sign. When you read the question, is there a future for African studies in Europe? Who of you was just scratching their heads? Two, three, five people, six were scratching their heads? Uh, can you boldly lift your hand? Okay, so quite a few. And who of you had a very clear answer to that as they were reading out? You don't have to say which answer, just who had a clear answer to themselves when they read out that question? Please put your hands all the way up so we can see properly against the light. It's not a trick, trick question, just trying to read the room. <laughs> Okay, okay, and the others were neutral? <laughs> what was that? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. We had a conversation prior, almost all of us, exactly about this question, how we can tackle the time and space we have at hand on how to even approach it, and we realized, before we even get to this question, we need to talk about certain definitions about that question. Of some of you are nodding. Who exactly was it who said the notion about Europe? What is Europe? Charleston, do you want to dive in back to that? Right. Um, so when we had that first conversation, um, when I taught at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, I couldn't um, have students answer any question without going through the variables of each question. All right? So that's what I applied to myself when I saw the question. So is there a future for African studies in Europe? Of course, the first thing I would want to do 
would be to discover what each, what each of these variables actually means. So what is future? What are we meaning it to use? What is African? You know, what, is it, what does it mean for us? Um, and what has it meant for us? What does it mean? And therefore, if it has to mean something in the future, we'll have to have some kind of engagement with its past meanings as well as its present implications. And of course, what does Europe mean, right? Um, in the same way in which you have the past kind of grammatical approach, right? So the past, present, future um, idea of, of working through what Africa means, the same thing must be applied in my mind to Europe. Yeah, so for me, to address this question, one has to begin with trying to discover and, and, and arriving at some consensus, in fact, as to what each of these variables actually means. And when you say Europe, we, for once, also talked about, are we talking about the geographical sense of Europe? Because even if we do, we have to, of course, consider that it's not just about the geographical location on where Europe is, but about the European concept, which of course is also now installed in other places, right? Now, Fanny, for example, I remember that you also brought up the question of African studies since you had both experiences. Do you want to maybe in, in close again? Yes, so basically I got so interested in studying Africa after I started traveling a little bit and not just to learn about the culture by of course speaking to the community which is very very important but also to kind of show a certificate or something you know and which is also a very European yeah. thing to do yes and so um the first thing I did was to look at possibilities of studying on the continent. So I come from the geography background. Um, my first master's degree is in um, geographic information technologies, quite um, related to my interest. But yeah, so I, I, I initially wanted to do something on African studies in terms of culture and indigenous knowledge. And uh, looking into the continent in Africa, um, I searched for um, universities that have African studies centers, reserving South Africa, which has very well established um, centers. But I feared because I was once rejected um, to study there, so I feared that I would again be rejected, and the um, cost of education is really expensive as well. Um, and then I looked into Ghana, which had also um, a, a center of African studies, um, and it, con it, it, it concentrated on, on history the most. So, yeah, so I, I ended up meeting really wonderful um, professors from the University of Cologne and uh, got in touch and I, I found myself here studying here, which was very, um, at first I was very shy to talk about um, going to Europe to study Africa because um, I had people questioning that too. <laughs> So, um, but I came and um, what I really fi found interesting, um, maybe we will get into that later, or, um, but basically um, the, 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 the courses were very broad and also limiting at one point because I had expected it's about Africa, so it should be about the whole Africa. But it turned out it is about the so-called sub-Saharan Africa, which I have a problem with because this racialized idea of Africa being sub-Saharan being homogeneous and um, North Africa not being really 
African really messed up my mind because not just because this was also um, um, an international university that I was um, attending, and I had already limited knowledge uh, that I have seen on TV about North Africa and all that. So I thought really it was different until I started traveling to North Africa. I end there for now. Of course, it does raise a question, right? If you come from the continent and then you go away from the continent to learn about the continent, to study it, it does raise a question, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> so, we also talked about, Star, you mentioned the fact that when you were studying, that there were that there were question marks on the credibility of also quoting and citing African scholars um, once you tried or once, yeah, somebody wanted to challenge the, the views and the opinions. Do you maybe want to dive back into that? Okay. Um, I don't really remember what you spoke about. It was a while ago. <laughs> But um, I, I would like to, because I remember, I think the point there was Europe, you, we shouldn't think about Europe as a geographical location, but as a, a, a center of power um, and a center of, of dominance. And we should always look at it in relation to the history, so the history of, of, of the continent. Uh, and uh, of Africa and Europe, which is a, quite a, an ugly, brutal, and unequal history. Um, and we see those traces uh, continuing today. But what I want to do, actually, this evening, to, <clears throat> to try and answer this question, um, I want to answer this question in, by sharing a, a story which, for me, just captures what I think about this question. Um, so beginning of the year, the, the Guardian uh, published an article by a historian, um, what's her name, Joel, Ka, Joel Cabrita. She published an, 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 an article about an African scholar, intellectual, um, by the name of Regina Twala. She's born in South Africa, um, and she's the, she's the second student to, a second black student to graduate at Vets University in Social Sciences um, in Johannesburg. And she's a political activist. She writes columns, she writes on racism and sexism. Um, she's an anti-colonial political uh, activist in the 1950s. Um, and of course she's involved in the struggle and she gets arrested and she's out and she relocates to, she exiles herself to Switzerland, uh, and she's married to someone in Switzerland, and, so she, and she lives there, and of course she struggles to find a job because she's a black woman, and with all her credibility, she struggles to publish and so on, and she gets hired by uh, an, an, a researcher in, 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 in Sweden, a professor based in Sweden, she, he hires her as a research assistant while she's based in, in, in Switzerland. And this professor is interested in questions of Christianity, black churches, um, um, yeah, and, and so she, she pays uh, Regina Twala to collect data, and Regina Twala does research, and she sends data to, to, to Sweden. Um, and she, part of her doing this research, she goes to churches to attend these churches, of course. So she sits there, she engages, and she observes these women dancing and, and doing all of that in church, dancing around the the, the king, uh, how they dance around King Sobuza at the time. And so she, writes, she thinks about this and she writes about this and she theorizes about this, these movements and how they carry sticks and, and, and what it means in relation to the king and so on. So she sends all this material to, to Sweden, of course, to, to the professor. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, she, she dies eventually uh, at, some po at some point and and in uh, 10 years after she dies, the professor publishes the, the, this book. Um, I'm trying to, the book is published in 1976. 
It's called Zulu Zion. Uh, and it's largely referred to by anyone who's interested in how Christianity in Africa expresses itself in existing indigenous uh, religious beliefs. So this, this, uh, this um, historian, Cabrita, who's been now going into the archives, studying Regina, says, how come nobody knows about this woman? And yet she, you know, and to, so she goes to, this, to, to the archives uh, in, at this university in uh, Uppsala. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. In, in, in Sweden, and she goes into the archives, like 50 years later, and she finds stacks of, of papers written by Regina Twala, um, and she finds actually a, a, a paragraph where Regina ex explains about the dancing of these women in church. And she says, only if you were at this church, you could write it like this. You know, she explains it, what it means. And, and in this book that's published in 1976, the exact paragraph is there. But of course, Regina's name is not there. Um, Regina's name is mentioned by this, this scholar, this Swedish scholar, in the acknowledgement section. But she's not referred to as a, a research assistant or a core researcher who actually was writing. She's, she's mentioned in passing as, as, um, as someone who helped this researcher get contacts in, 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 in Switzerland. Oh, I want to, she's, she's, she's late at this time, right? So she says, the late Regina Twala who helped me make contact with people in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, and of course, Regina didn't do that. Regina wrote part of, of, of that. And she's plagiarized and she's not mentioned. And the professor is, is cited highly, everybody respects him. And nobody knows about Regina. Uh, and she found that actually there were just more than and then she says something which I want to bring here, which I just want to read quickly. I'm sorry my story is long, but I think it's important because it is about Regina Twala. Um, and so, so, this, uh, so Cabrita then says in this article, after explaining all of this, what, what happened between this, with this professor and, and, and Regina, so she, she says, this then is the untold story of scholarship of the hidden realities behind the, the, the closely published books that find their way on the shelves of our libraries. We think of knowledge as floating in a realm detached from the messy business of everyday life. In fact, mundane realities of race and gender shape what is counted as knowledge. And actually for me, I don't even think it's mundane. I think, I think that's the, the crux of, of what we're talking about here, right? And, and gender here is not incidental. And, and, and of course, race, uh, both uh, w w working hand in hand. I'm, and I'm raising this story because uh, this is, this, Re Re Regina was, right, was an activist writing in the 1950s, right? This is 2000 and, 2023. And so many of us can relate uh, to Regina's story because it's a reality for, for most of us. I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hands, but if I were to ask some scholars in this room who can relate uh, to Regina's in different ways. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I see, I see a, f a few hands. So, so for me, that's, that's the crux of it. Uh, if we think about the future of Europe, um, of, of African studies in Europe, how, how do we, how do we deal up with these power, 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 dyna power dynamics, which still shape, which still very much shape uh, knowledge production today. Thank you. I'm actually quite a huge fan of asking the audience. Thank you very much, and I also very much think it's a very good example of where the status quo in regards to that conversation is. And I would like to ask the, the audience, who can relate to the story shared by Star? If you can just raise your hands and raise them high, because since you're so many, it's not that easy to detect these hands. And you can also wave them so I can detect the movement. All right. For now, we can, we can wait with the questions. I just wanted to, to see who we have in the audience to have an idea of how are we going to continue this conversation? Because if most are in a similar context, so to say, then we can talk completely different than if there's no one who can relate to what we're talking about is here. Faisal, when we talked prior, 
you said it's very much about tools and outcomes, politics and economy. Do you want to touch back on that regarding the question, what you thought when you heard the question first? Is there a future for African studies in Europe? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so, so I always ask myself this question when you know, we have gatherings like this. Why are we having this conversation in Cologne and not in Maputo or Accra? Good question. I think the reason is simple. It's because at some point in history, Europe conquered Africa. Okay? Now, this process of conquest, which was material, was preceded and cemented by intellectual conquest. Right? Now, this process of cementing material conquest with intellectual conquest means that power relations in terms of geopolitics and political economy is central to any notion of shifting the basis of knowledge production. Okay? So that it's absolutely normal to think about, oh, let's shift the terms of knowledge production, but we remain in a situation where extractivism drives African economies. Okay? So the point I'm simply trying to make is this, that any idea of the future of African studies in Europe has to ask the question, but what is the role of knowledge production and social transformation? And I'll cite some examples just to concretize this. So in Africa, you have two, I think, important sites, you know, where co colleagues come together to think about the continent through uh, 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 this, this academic enterprise. One is CODESTRIA, Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, and one is ASAA, right? Now, central to the formation of CODESTRIA was how can intellectuals on the continent take their social responsibility seriously? Because they cannot afford distancing. They cannot afford to think of the continent as an intellectual object, as a site of curiosity. It is an existential question. So I think any notion of a future has to really confront the question of commitment. Is African studies about studying Africa or is it about a commitment to Africa? Right? And so I was really looking at some of the associations that study Africa when the Ukraine war broke out and African students were prevented from, from leaving Ukraine. And, and, and the silence was remarkable. Important sites where Africa is studied, you know, there was nothing. Many universities changed their rules, I think legitimately, to accommodate people who have been bombarded. But none of these centers of African studies thought that African students, in particular here in Germany, you know, were fleeing. And I'm currently doing a research with some of them who have been given eviction notices to leave Germany. None of these centers thought it was important to, to thematize this, but also to ask the question, what is the role of solidarity in a context of war, right? So, so, so for me, this thing about power is really central, you know, to, 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 else what we do is we skirt around the issues, right? And then engage in an intellectual exercise Right, which is brilliant, I love, I love that. But, but the point is, what does it do? Right? And we have to also uh, finally ask, and I promise I'll stop now, we have to finally ask the question, right? How did African studies begin? In the US, we know the history, right? Cold War, uh, well, pre-Cold War, kind of, the emergence of the US uh, post-Second World War as the site, uh, you know, important superpower which was trying to have spheres of interest. But in Europe, uh, African studies really was largely, especially through colonial anthropology, the handmaiding of colonialism. Okay? But there was a precursor to that, which is a bunch of Africans, you know, uh, some brought here initially as slaves, but also some who had come to study in the, in the latter part of the 1700s and 1800s, who were thinking about the rights of people, in particular the idea of the Moor, writing about them, Amu was a key figure in that, in that regard. Amu was writing in, in, in Jena, when people like Hegel came over there, completely ignored what he was working on. Because at that time, the momentum was an expansionist project. Okay? So, so I'm just trying to, 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 to say a number of things, just to say one thing, that power is central. And if we do not address the question of power, then I don't think any future is really possible without taking account of the present and how the present is unequal. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Divine, I saw you nodding strongly. Would you like to share with us what that question 
sparked in your mind? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and again, thank you for the opportunity for having the discussion. Um, when I was invited, I, was, I felt very uncomfortable first uh, because, you know, I, I am a guest in ICAS. ICAS is my home, but I'm a guest in ICAS. And it's very important to respect your guests, you know, or your hosts. Yeah, so, um, and, and I think that uh, it is not our place to tell Europeans what to do with African studies. Uh, it, it is not my place to tell Europeans what to do with African studies. I, I do think that that's a question um, that, I mean, the African Union is commemorating 60 years, I think, uh, this year. And uh, this is more than 60 years of posing the same question over and over and over. Um, and... and I know it's important to ask that question, um, but I still see a Mrs. S question, you know. I still see a Mudimbe's question. I still see Oyerunke's question. When, where I, I see the question being posed over and over and over. So I, I think that uh, the question of African studies is not something we should spend too much time asking uh, are questions about uh, because the answers I think uh, it's so many years of knowledge production we have to ask ourselves why we are not reading it and why we are not taking uh, some of that research seriously and I think that's really where we should focus why after more than 60 years of research posing the same question we are unable to focus on some of the answers you know, if you look at Joseph Kizerbo, if you look at Pauline Otonji, if you look at all of the scholars who have produced knowledge over time, this has been a very important question, whether the idea of Africa. So I would say it's, it's really not our place to ask you. I'm really focused, more interested in what we do with this on the continent and with each other. And, and I think uh, it is very important that on the continent, we find ways to cross borders. We find ways to think across borders. And I think African studies provides us with a space to do that. Um, because, you know, I, I can tell you how much I, I know about English history, my fingertips. I can tell you about Brazilian history, my fingertips. But there is so much that we need to begin to know about each other on the continent that we are not spending time doing because we are wasting too much time asking about what Europe should do with itself. It's Europe's problem, you know? Uh, I, I think... And, and, I, and I think that that's the point of decoloniality. And, you know, people, lots of scholars or... Every time you throw decoloniality, it's as if you've brought a juju into the house. And, <laughs> Uh, uh, but decoloniality, just like feminist work, just like the work of all emancipatory movements, is just to find a dignified way to inhabit the world, you know, and a more inclusive way to inhabit the world, to, to allow us to be more free, to allow us to expand our knowledge spaces. And I think when we stop asking this question, uh, we would be focusing on asking the important questions that would allow us to move to this dignified space. And I think over time, the research that African studies has done has pointed us to really deep conceptual vocabularies, to conceptual tools that if we spend time deepening, we would be able to offer humanity other ways of having to see and inha inhabit the world. You know? But we cannot do that if we spend so much time asking about what Europe should do with African studies and what it should do with the future. As the uh, uh, American Indian activist Vijay Prashad recently said, that uh, we are spending so much time focusing on the future when uh, 2.7 billion people are hungry now. You know, but 
We want to spend so much time talking about what they're going to do tomorrow. It's not that it's not important, but 2.7 billion people are hungry now. And if we don't focus on that, I think we're wasting a lot of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Devon. Jonathan, would you like to also share your, your piece so we can write off that question? <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, going, being the last person, then I get the opportunity to say, I don't know, respond to anyone, respond to all of you. And uh, first of all, I would start by saying I have a slightly different take on this from my uh, colleague Divine. I think this is a very important question. And the reason I think it is, is because all the different things we talked about, whether it's about taking care of billions of, or hundreds of millions of people who are uh, starving, it is connected to the question of knowledge production and how knowledge about Africa is produced. And when I listen to, you know, the comment of STAR, you know, the response of STAR and also Pfizer, the one thing, common thread which I got from them, you know, they talked about issues which are related to exclusion in knowledge production. You know, the kind of approaching Africa as a place of extracting knowledge, and that is just the uh, relationship. So for me, my response to this question goes first like in one or two steps. The first is, why is the, where is the question even coming from? We know it is not happening in a vacuum. So the reason why we are asking why this question is so important, in my opinion, is because, first of all, going back to what African studies, especially in its present form, modern African studies, what it is all about, basically it is about, you know, foregrounding the African experience for grounding the African uh, knowledge in the studies and theories and methods which are applied to studies on Africa and the people of Africa and African societies. And this approach came about as a critique to traditional, the method and approaches that were used in traditional disciplines, yeah, the more established traditional disciplines. So, the role of African studies, in my point of view, is like a pushback. Like the way you're going about studying Africa and its people is very questionable because it results to the story which Star just mentioned and also the point which uh, Faisal mentioned. Yeah. Because the way knowledge is produced, the way we go about it, is something that needs a very careful examination. Now, the question, the point is, the next point then becomes, if that is what African studies is about, yeah, and that's where I can understand perhaps the frustration or why divine has a different take. If this is the goal of African studies, then why are we discussing this? Why are we still discussing this issue? Maybe 60 years after political independence. My response to that is uh, where basically it means even though African studies has a very, uh, I would say, honorable goal, what they've done or what they're doing so far is inadequate. So it doesn't mean that we should dismiss what African studies is doing, but we need to, you know, go further. We need to do something better because the present approach is not working. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think I will just leave it like that for now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So as you've heard, we have very different perspectives to the same question, which I think is the most interesting because that way we get to discuss, we get to exchange, we get to listen to people who disagree with us, which I think is such a good exercise in also yeah, just expanding our horizons and just 
finding common grounds or maybe just learning completely different sides to a story that we haven't considered just yet. Already listening to all of you just... I had so many questions to each and every one and every angle has their own right. And I would like to offer, let's say, a framework of um, the four eyes that I have not invented. Um, it's this framework of the four eyes of discrimination and I feel that they might be interesting to this conversation. Is anyone familiar with the four eyes of discrimination? I... One person says no. <laughs> and we are how many in this room? No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I don't know why I'm acting like a professor myself. I'm not. I'm not. Um, so the four I's, they start with ideology. The first I stands for ideology, right? The second one stands for institution. The third one stands for interpersonal. And the fourth one stands for internalized internalization. And I feel that these four eyes have popped up in all these different perspectives to the question. And when Divine, Divine said, why are we concerned with the way Europe views African studies? I thought to myself, yes, you're right. Let's just, you know, turn our backs and do our own thing about it. And at the same time, I had in mind um, what Faisal was saying, we're talking about, and also what Star was saying, we're talking about power, we're talking about um, monopolizing, again, power, resources, politics, right? So even if we wanted to, we have to honestly look at the status quo of the world and where the continent stands in that, right, with the history of it, that we are not on a level play field, right? And therefore, I do think the question of where we are going, we very much have to think of where are we here and today, and why are we here there today? That is a fairly rhetorical question um, on why, where we are here today. I'm just posing it to maybe create another level of where we can discuss from and maybe not that much, is it a valid question or not, but rather, where are we going to move from today? Because I very strongly agree there are two billion people starving today and we need these solutions today. And on so many occasions, we are in formats like this, and we talk and we talk and we agree and we say yes, 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 and we feel that the world has changed, and then we step outside and we realize ideology in the majority is still different. The way it translates into the institutions, and therefore who has access to what resources is still very different. For example, the fact that it is always a challenge to get all the right speakers to the right panels because of visa issues, right? We can. So already, so already there we see it is not a level play field at all. And then um, how, what are the images we have about each other, right, from each other? They are also not equal and they're not inclusive at all. And then again, I feel the trickiest eye of those four eyes is the fourth, actually, the internalization part that we also, from a continental side, from a diasporic side, um, also have to be extremely mindful. And I remember how you mentioned the, the aspect of also the European desire, right? Um, that, is, that is very real. Why did you feel that you have to come to Europe to study, to get a legitimate certificate in order to present it? All these different layers, all these different questions. Please. All right. Okay. Yes. Um, so I find the conversation quite intriguing thus far, but I have to admit that which I did say in our conversation previously, I am very impatient with academic conferences for obvious reasons. Go right. on. No. <laughs> so, so one of the challenges I've had with the way in which ideas for conferences are framed um, is, you know, as much as we try to, to, to do the granular thing, we, we often 
do not escape becoming generalized um, terribly. So thus far, we've been talking about African futures, but I haven't heard once uttered the word diaspora. I just said it. Oh, yes, you did. Aha, uh -huh. right. <laughs> so, but, but that's an interesting thing to recognize, though, all right? Because um, so often, Africa dia Africa's diasporas are eclipsed from conversations regarding African futures. Absolutely. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we also get the, the diaspora also, which is directly connected to that eclipsing, we also become um, morphed into a continental discussion. And therefore, we become invisible again. Hmm? So, two days ago, someone saw my wife and I walking through um, Cologne, and they said, oh, you're from Africa. And I was so ha uh, well, no, I'm from the Caribbean. Um, but that's part of the trouble, though, right? Um, conversations regarding how we... Um, curate programs for academic study at the advanced level um, often do not necessarily incorporate all the variables that really need to be incorporated simply because I think the appetite for discussion also has to be taken into consideration. The appetite for discussion is often influenced by the, the appetite for funding the appetite for scholarships, et cetera. So I know of students in the Caribbean, for example, who have applied for postdoctoral um, scholarships or um, postdoctoral fellowships 76 times, and they were turned down 76 times. Hmm? Um, and you, by now you know what the, how tumultuous the application process is. So sometimes it takes about two, three hours to apply. So calculate that and think about how many times it took, how many hours it took somebody to apply for a postdoc fellowship 76 times and then to be turned down 76 times. But you may see a program at a University of Cologne, for example, um, advertising or trying to welcome people into a, an African-based program. Now, what does that mean for the Caribbean student, Afro-Caribbean student who has been turned down 76 times? So, I'll go back to Divine's um, perspective, right? In terms of the question you raised about why is this question important? Well, I suppose it's important because 60 years of talking about this still means, doesn't, didn't take away the troubles that we still get at, at airports, right? With the state apparatus. 60 years of studying Africa in Europe didn't help the students from the Caribbean who tried to get into Europe 76 times. So clearly, I think the question is still relevant. Um, and what we do with it, I think, is the more important thing, which is why I want to swing back the conversation to the definition, the definitional, um, um, the definitional context of each of the variables in the, in the question. One cannot have an answer to this question if one does not try to come up with what each of these variables means and try to see what kind of consensus there is beyond one's own perspective. Otherwise, it's very subjective. Thank you. Did someone raise their hand? I wasn't sure. Yes, please, yeah. Divine. Uh, and after Divine, I would like to know whether there are questions in the audience. And if you have some questions cooking, then prepare them. And right after Divine, you'll get the chance to ask. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, I, I'm not saying the question is not important. It's a very important question, but we are spending too much time on it. That there are so many other questions to ask that we, we, we have to ask. You know, if, a few years ago, uh, the, I think it's Nigerian British scholar Ben Okri. Yes, Nigerian British uh, scholar Ben Okri uh, was uh, in, in South Africa to give the Steve Biko lecture. And something that struck me was something he said about having a nightmare. That when you wake up from a nightmare, it's a big confusion. And the confusion is all-encompassing because you're asking yourself so many questions. Was it a nightmare? 
we will see the story. What does it mean? And what should you do with a nightmare? I think the, post-colo- the post-colonial context and the post colonial is a nightmare we've woken up from. You know, every post-oppressive context is a nightmare that we've woken up from. But when you wake up from a nightmare, you have to live with it because you've had the experience of it. You, you cannot completely throw it. And I think that's the, the, I, the concept of the colonial library uh, really tells us that whatever we do, it precedes. It's so present and so strong. You know, uh, what do we do? What do you do when you've been afflicted by a virus? You know, the virus and the host are codependent. You know, if the host kills the virus, if the host kills the virus, it dies. If the virus kills the host, they die. So they have to find a way to coexist. And I think that's where we should be pushing to, you know. And, and there are lots of ideas about doing this, whether it's about convivial knowledge, whether it's about expanding knowledge archives. You know, there, there's so many ways that we can do this. And we should move to that. We, we should be moving to the place where, uh, like I said several weeks ago, uh, in, in, in Oxford, we have to be dancing our own dance. We are spending so much time showing how other people's dances are being danced and dancing other people's dances that we are unable to dance our own dances and also force other people to dance our own dances. And to do that, I think African studies provides us with a platform really on the continent to, to invest in doing a kind of a communal science, to do a science where human compassion is at the center, to do a science where we understand what Ubuntu is, where we understand what friendship is. It's not my place, I I can't force Europeans to understand that stopping a visa is inhumane. Europeans have to deal with their inhumanity. You know, if 60 years of doing African studies haven't shown Europeans that Ubuntu means having to deal with joy and discomfort, I can't teach them, you know. But it's important that we focus you know, we begin to build with each other on, on the continent. And I think through that, this Africa Center knowledge that we are looking for uh, we will, will flourish. But we can't do that if we spend so much time asking this important question over and over and over. Thank you. I'm... I very much like your metaphor that you used. And just to piggyback on that metaphor, how do you feel can we switch or change or readjust the status quo so people want to dance where it's from, where the dance is from? How can we facilitate and create that space, that dance floor, the DJ, the drinks, you get the picture? (laughs) The food, the music, to remind ourselves, but also globally to remind where that dance is from. When at the moment, everybody loves to outsource, and if it's from abroad, then it's interesting, then it's verified, then it's credible. How do you feel can we invite people to that party back home? Please. Sure. I, I just and I did not forget the part about the question. Just bear with me. Sorry, I didn't want to miss um, that point about diaspora. I think it's a very important one. Um, because if you think of the history of this thing called African studies, right? I mean, this was something that began with a Pan-Africanist impulse. So Du Bois wrote this book, uh, Africa in the World, uh, The World in Africa, which was really trying to write against the antinomies of the scholarship then, to say you have a, a folk that has got an essence and these people are separate from the rest. What he was trying to do was to think conjuncturally. He was thinking about connections, right, through trade, exchange of ideas. And the diaspora was so central in that process. And, and I think, unlike Divine, I'm going to be a bit more generous. So I will, I will kind of try and, 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 and engage in the debates. I, I think the diaspora is so important to this question. Look, there are many 
Africans or Afro-Europeans who consciously avoid spaces like this, consciously. They avoid spaces like this. And the question is why? Kirk Green wrote this piece about um, African Caribbean kids in the UK and their relationship to the academy. And his claim is that there is perhaps an apprehension in the academy that these people might come knocking and possibly they might break the door of the academy because they have a stake. And this is what I mean. So it's possible to say, oh, you know, African studies, Africans in Africa. But the diasporic scholars or people in the diaspora actually leave the horrors in the belly of the empire. And so they're not dealing with Africa as something distant. They're dealing with the reality of ongoing dehumanization here. And I think if one is thinking of a transformative agenda, then that question has to be central. Because part of the, 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 the intellectual uh, uh, limits of African studies, I think, is this separation, this idea that you can cut off Africa or a slice of Africa and study it in isolation, right? I mean, it, it methodologically doesn't work, but it works for a number of reasons, right? Jobs are related to it, of course. These are practical questions. You know, are you an, an expert of 14th century Swahili history? You know, it's like, that's it. That's where it begins, and then you move to another one. But I, w I would end with, with a, few, a few points. So there's a sociologist here called Akosia Dakwa who wrote a piece called um, Doing Sociology from the Ground Up, um, uh, 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 a Ghanaian sociologist view. So she presented it at a meeting of the, the, the American uh, Sociological Association. And one of the, the points he makes is this, that you see, often this idea of building an alternative canon you know, is put forward, right? But the question is, what do you do when you have students who know Ibn Khaldun, who know Mafeje, who have read Amina Mama's work, and then you send them to Cologne, and then the professor of sociology is like, <laughs> what is this? Right? So, so the, 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 the point about taking African scholarship seriously is important. And it's important for two reasons. One, this debate about decolonization actually happened in the immediate aftermath of formal independence in Africa. Right? So in, 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 in places like Ibadan, Makerere, Dar es Salaam, people were dealing with issues of concepts and categories, right? So this thing called tradition. I was in a number of presentations today, and people use the term tradition, right? But what is it? Is tradition a thing or is a process, right? People talk about our tradition, but that thing has a history, right? Because you need a tradition to distinguish it from modernity, right? My own discipline, sociology, is a discipline of modernity. But then you give the, 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 the anthropologist kind of, you know, the, the traditional, right? That which is unchanging. But these things still form part of the tools that are used today, right? So, so for me, this question of building an alternative canon which sits side by side and engages in a conversation with the established canon, I think it's a very important one. I think the diaspora is so crucial here, you know, to say, how do we take the struggles of the diaspora seriously instead of just, you know, seeing it as, 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 as something, 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 something on the, on the, on, on, on the side. And, and the final point I, I want to make right, is there are people like, that I think are doing fantastic work here, and, and some of my friends, I'm not trying to kind of just give you a shout out for nothing, but I think you're doing good things. So, so people like Francisca Zanka, you know, I think they're really doing important work to, 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 to question, you know, the narrowness of migration studies. You see, the, the, the whole theoretical basis of it right, is from a particular historical trajectory, which then gets abstracted and applied to the rest of the world. And these people are really thinking seriously in conversation with the rest in a very, what I think, ethical manner, right? So, so, so there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are there are spaces of hope, I think. But the question, I think, is you cannot just sidestep a process. You have to deal with the elephant. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's easier to sidestep it. And if we don't deal with the elephant, I don't know, in 2057, this might be the topic of the next ECAS meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, once again, so many questions in my mind. And I remember we wanted to leave space. Um, there's this gentleman with the orange 
clothing. If you could please raise your hand again so someone with a microphone can see you. Yeah. We, we, have, we have this te technology for... In case there's anybody who can hear my voice. Here we go. Um, I have been looking at the question and I'm asking myself, maybe there's going to be a part two, a sequel of this like Nollywood would do. Is there a future of African studies in Europe? Would that question, when you change that four to off, would we be saying something different? The other question is, is there a future for African languages in Europe? Hmm. Are we taking stock of how African languages are being studied in Europe? And then I dare ask, is there a future for African languages in Africa. Thank you very much. Mm. All right, let's maybe, since there were three questions, Charleston, you, you felt compelled to answer to this one. <laughs> I, thank you for your question, brother. Um, let, me, let me start to answer by, by saying this. I can think of no, no university in the Caribbean in which there is a European Studies Center. Neither a Euro-American Studies Center. And I'm saying that for a reason. So I have to also admit and be honest about my own angst about the interest of African languages in Europe and the interest of African studies in Europe. Um, what is the need, I would ask? And whose need is it? What's the intention? And whose intention is it? And I go back to that word I had used earlier, consensus. Did Africans and its diaspora have any consensus on the study of African languages in Europe? Did we even okay it? So I think those are important questions to ask. I don't have an answer, but I will you know, endorse the questions by, by saying, um, one of the things that I, I think we all must do is ask ourselves individually a very important question. Where am I? What is really my perspective? in relation to Europe and in relation to Africa and its diaspora? That's a very hard question, and it's an honest question, because you might find answering the question might give you or give us um, reason to understand that we're not entirely all wiggled ourselves out of enslavement in ways that we think we have. Neither, uh, we would also come to, come to realize, I hope, that it's not as easy. When Bob Marley sang that song, which everybody just sings quite easily, Emancipate Yourself from Mental Slavery, there was no race attached to that. It was mental enslavement. So the question I think we need to ask ourselves, here in Europe and in Africa and in the diaspora is, what does Europe mean to me? What does European history mean to me? Where, which side of it do I sit? Or is it that I sit in the middle? But I think all those questions have to be you know, um, waded through if we have to come to any honest place of determining what will happen with African languages in Africa, if they are studied in Europe, and what will happen with Africa when African studies becomes very heavy and central in Europe. Honest questions, I think, must be asked and perhaps answered over a decade. Thank you so much, and I think it's... It's a sign of a fruitful conversation if we leave with more questions than we came with. And maybe another question to just put it out there in the room. Who is even creating these curriculums? And to what extent are they true? And to what extent is our decolonizing still colonized. More questions. I saw several hands up. Um, 
the gentleman in the very first row. And the lady over there waving dynamically. I see you, I see you now. That's the kind of energy I need. Thank you. I'm Please. starting, oh, ladies, ladies first. If you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Please. <laughs> um, thank you, I had to. Yes. Right. My name is Mutsidi Matibe from South Africa, University of Pretoria. And this is a very interesting question. For me, when I saw it, I wanted to come because I thought it was going to be answered. And you can get your money back. <laughs> because I've got two issues, the future in the question and the panel itself. Because the future for me is, what does it mean? Is it future in the next minute? Is it future in the next month or 50 years to come? That for me needs to be explained, to be unpacked. Number two, the panel for me is not the right panel because I was expecting a European to sit there and answer that question. But now they're pushing it to the continent and say, do you see the future? My question is, what's the present? What's the current? Before I answer the future. Thank you. So I guess we now have to find a new topic. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Just uh, because uh, thank to the panelists huh, for your excellent... Uh, and we, just for one moment, we will, I did not forget your question and we will definitely touch on this. Let us gather this question yeah, as well and yeah. then we'll get to both. Yeah, just to congratulate the panelists uh, for their excellent contribution. Even uh, sometimes there are uh, <laughs> the divergence of views. Sorry that I'm more francophone than an English speaker, but I introduce myself. I'm coming from the United Nations. I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland, and I'm working on anti-racism agenda. Kamara? From, uh, what? <laughs> I believe we've met. Okay, okay. I'm from the United Nations and working on anti-racism. And now I'm leading also the section on people of African descent, including the International Decade for People of African Descent, that we are finalizing the program of activities. I see my brother who is from West Indies. I think Sir Hilary Beckley was your, <laughs> your professor, probably, and uh, the other one. And I will not enter into the diasporic things and, uh, because it, it makes sense. It makes sense. But what I want to say due to this uh, subject, despite the history, because we have, we have uh, something to sort out with Europe when we talk about Africa. Getting out from denial, the getting out of uh, neglection, or this kind of things. But we talk about reconciliation. We talk about reconciliation. And this topic, we need to, to go into it because we Africans, we know Europe. We know Europe. We were trained in French or in <laughs> whatever, English. We know them, but they don't know us. They don't know us. And <laughs> I don't have a question. <laughs> and having African studies will mean for me that they need to know us. They need to know us. But the objective uh, is to build a future, a common future, a common humanity. Because it's about reconciliation. It's not about shouting. The history is there. We have something to solve, frankly. But it's about building a common humanity. I think it's the issue. Thank For you. me, this topic is about that. Thank you.
Now, back to the previous question. I'm not sure whether we can answer it. I would like to try. Please. I won't ans un answer it per se, but um, uh, perhaps um, what, I, what I found very interesting is what I'm involved at this point, which gives me some hope. So basically, um, I'm doing a PhD study that is binationally supervised. I feared after my master's degree that um, if I just focus on being here and um, have one particular supervisor or two from just Europe, I see a lack of um, collaboration. And it's, it's very important to have African people, whether it's now in, from the diaspora or from the continent, involved in the co-supervision, in the agreement. But I, I am one of the very few. Um, so when one is studying here, it, it's likely that the supervisors would be from here, or if they are from the continent, then their involvement may not be compensa compensated for. And, and therefore, it is very, very difficult for professors on the other side to take up another re responsibility. Um, so I, I think there is a, a potential in, in these um, African futures um, or African, African study uh, futures. Um, and um, I think in terms of language, I wanted also to, to give a very inspiring um, experience I have had while I was studying here. So I was very curious to study Kiswahili. I know I have encountered, or I had encountered people who would ask me why would I want to study Kiswahili while I'm in Germany. And I... I, I often say I am here for a short time, but I'm going back to Africa, and this language is going to help me so much to connect with people from different parts of Africa. And um, I'm very happy to, um, to say I took Kiswahili, even if it was just the basic, it helped me a lot. And I, I was very um, impressed that you know, the, the teacher or the lecturer was also from Tanzania, not somebody who learned Kiswahili maybe... On YouTube. Yeah, or from here and... <laughs> yeah, so I, I do see the potential. I think, um, yeah, there is a lot to do to get there, but also I think um, it's very funny because coming from the society that I do, we, we don't talk much about the future. We talk about the present. And um, to envision the future, I think it's a scholar thing sometimes than the society that is being studied. Um, and yeah, it has been now how long that these studies have been going on? What solutions did they bring? Um, that's one question that I, I, I tend to uh, reflect on often. Thank you. All the way, almost all the way in the back, there is a person waving, almost all the way in the back with a black um, sweatshirt, I think. In the middle. Further back, further back. On the left. We have to be fair, right? Here we go. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my questions will address Singular. some of the concerns that have been addressed by the previous two speakers. When I read the topic, is there a future for African studies in Europe? Uh, it elicits for me two aspects. One, is there a future for Africa 
in African studies in Europe? Is there a future for Africa in African studies in Europe? It will, if that, that answer will address the questions of the panelists on the far right who talked about why this discussion is not being held in Maputo or somewhere in Nairobi where I come from. Because I think the question is not to address African problems, but the question seeks to uh, lead us to the second question I need to ask. That is it sustainable to continue generating knowledge on Africa in Europe? In essence, European institutions which are running programs on Africa are asking whether it is sustainable to continue running such programs. And that will address the question of the lady who talked about the suitability of the panel. The panel does not have a European uh, you know, panelist because if we can get an answer to this third question, that is it true to conclude that the focus of this topic is uh, the focus of the topic on the future, the aspect of the future, that the first panelist just after you talked about the variables in the topic, the aspect future. Is the future there, the focus on that future, is it, is it on African problems or is it on the future of the sustainability of such programs here? For example, the Global South Studies Institute of the University of Cologne in the next few years will it be relevant? Can it continue operating? That is my, uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Star, do you feel compelled to respond? <laughs> well, um, I'm not even sure if I can answer the question, but I, I, I have a few points to, to say in case I don't have another chance to speak because I'm also looking at the time. Yes, um, I was going to say something about that, we would take five, maximum 10 minutes before we close off, just so you have an idea. Okay. Um, so for me also, like I said earlier, we, Europe is not just a geographical location. Some of us are studying in, in South Africa, but what are we reading? What are we, what are we being taught? You know, if you look at the, 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 if you look at the reading lists that some of our professors give us is, 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 is European scholars. So it's, it's not just because you, you are studying in Europe as a location. Europe is everywhere, you know. It, it, it crosses borders, it crosses everything, anytime, anywhere. So it's quite dominating also in terms of what we're reading. So the, the, the trick or the task is uh, how we we bring in other, how we engage with other, 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 other scholars who are rethinking um, Africa. I mean, there's, there's, a lot, there's, a lot, there's a lot of that is already happening. Uh, and we, our task is to engage not in paternalistic ways. Uh, if, you think, if, if I think about, for example, um, uh, institutions like uh, Feminist Africa, which is deliberate in rewriting history uh, in ways that women are not written as, as, as uh, in ways that are infantilizing, in ways that are victimizing, but as political actors. But when you, because when you read a lot of history books and how Europeans have portrayed African women, it's just those pictures of women with naked breasts serving men and being mothers. And that becomes uh, how, we, like, a, like, like a status quo, how women are, are conceptualized in, 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 in literature. So how do we rethink that and, and, and learn some of that and be deliberate uh, in engaging with, 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 with that? Yeah, so that will be just my, my closing because I'm, I'm looking at the watch and I, I, I don't think there will be another chance for me to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. So, yes, I'm also looking at the watch, and since we're quite a few people on the panel, I had asked you previously, because I personally am a huge fan, if it's possible, not by force, but if it's possible to leave a space as such today with a constructive thought, with a constructive impulse. So we did not only just discuss in circles, and therefore I would like to invite the panelists, if there is an impulse that you want to share, a thought you have to share, maybe also another question, because we're definitely going to leave with more questions than answers, because that is the whole point of today, I think. Um, then I would like to invite whoever feels compelled first to share their constructive closing remark of today's conversation, because I understand there are so many layers to it, and yes, we cannot, as I said, the lady will get her money back, we cannot um, answer that question fully, whether there is a future or not, because there are still so many variables in it that we have not defined. And I think this will be a continuous process to continuously define them. And therefore, I'll leave the, the floor to my dear panelists. Jonathan, would you like to start? Okay. Uh, well, the first thing which I would say is that uh, the issue of the future of African studies and whether it is Europe has a stake in it or not is something which uh, I think is not even up to anyone as a divine mention to tell Europeans what to do or not to do because they will continue to study Africa. They will continue to mind Africa's business, whether Africans like it or not. But then what is very important is like in the beginning, you know, the rector and a number of speakers, they did mention some very catastrophic events. You know, they talked about the pandemic, they talked about the war in Ukraine, and they talked about the famine in East Africa. And what all these catastrophe have in common is that they started as local problems. They are very localized. You can place them in specific places. But within a very short period of time, you could see that the effect and implication went viral and global. And that's exactly what African studies, the issue which African studies is trying to address might sound as a local issue, but it is very global. And precisely because we are dealing with problems which you know expand across borders and regions, it is the more reason why we cannot close the door and say, well, we think that this is our problem or this problem is only connected to this specific region, so the rest of the world don't have a say to it. That would be a mistake, yeah. So the discussion now, the, 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 the issues we are trying to discuss, in my opinion, is not even about whether we should open the doors to everyone or to other people, but about setting up, you know, like the terms, you know, coming to some kind of consensus and understanding about how to go about solving local or regional problems which have global implications. And today, most of the problems we face are, have that kind of global implications. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say again that uh, I think there's a future for African studies. Uh, the discomfort I had was also with the panel because, like I said, it's not my place to tell <laughs> the Europeans what to think uh, because knowledge production is collaborative. I think it would have been great to have that variety here. But again, we acknowledge the respect, you know, to have a group of people, you know, to have this conversation. But there is a future for African studies, otherwise we'll not be here. And I'm looking forward to praying. Uh, Prague in several years, and I, like I was telling Amanda, I'm challenging ICAS to take 2027 to the continent, you know, so, um, and, and I think, yeah, yeah, and 
I'm not doing that because I want to live a life to respond to racism, because I think we cannot live our life as a response to Europe. That's what I'm really emphasizing, because I think it's a travesty if we spend our entire life responding to Europe. Um, but I think that new knowledge is important for Europe. It's not just important for us. There, there are lots, as long as we don't take science as a communal exercise, there are lots of discoveries that Europe itself is missing because we are not including all of this perspective. And I think African studies has provided space for that. And the next year is what we should be doing is investing in those. The, I was very happy to see that Mamadou Diawara was giving one of the keynotes and others because they're doing groundbreaking work, investing in conceptual work with Makamo. That this investing in these scientific conceptual vocabularies help us to make other experiences intelligible. And that's what we should be investing in. African studies should be moving to that rather than focusing on repeating the question over and over whether we need it or not. You know, because we need it. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So, so these are my uh, kind of positive uh, <laughs> final words. Um, so, so I think I think the first thing for me is this: that I think anyone should be able to study anything. Human beings are curious. I don't think. You know, studying a place should be bounded by, you know, how a person looks. But I think we have to take history seriously. We have to take context seriously. For me, these things are important. And, um, and I want to use this, 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 well, this small kind of example. So there's a guy called Herman, Herbert Villacazi who wrote a short text. And the title of the text is this, Was Karl Marx Black? That was the title of the text. Now, the first part of the text carries the science of the moment, I mean, some kind of eugenics nonsense and so on. But the latter part of the text, I think, is important, which is that he was thinking of blackness as a commitment, that if Karl Marx had lived in apartheid South Africa, where would his loyalty be? And for me, this was a major push against what colonial science meant, which is that people are this and that is all they are, where identity is seen as fixed and unchanging. Now, the reason why I, 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 I cited that um, example is to say that, for me, the key thing is not how a person looks, but where they are thinking from. How does the world look from where I'm sitting is important. What debates am I involved in? What are my commitments, right? As Star says, you know, some of our, you know, one can be based in Burundi, but they can be the most Eurocentric scholar you can have. Right? Because Eurocentrism is, is not something limited to, to a particular place. But really, location matters. I think that is something crucial. Because you cannot understand a society by using tools that are derived from a particular historical experience without attempting to do. You just can't do that. Else, what you're going to do is you're imposing one set of experience on another. So instead of analysis, you're engaging in misanalysis. So the final thing I want to do is to quote something that uh, John Lesdell said, uh, well, wrote in a, in a text in 2005 in, in Africa Spectrum. And this is what he says. <clears throat> how far can we look to our predecessors for lessons in how to edge? Not that Europe does something, but that Africans be allowed a better chance to help themselves. Thank you very much. I think I have two concluding remarks. The first one is that, unfortunately, a lot of communities are getting tired of being studied without seeing any change. So it's perhaps good to publish and you know, to, to get promoted and you know, get all the recognition of whatever you have done as a study, but do think of those that you are studying. What future do they have in these studies? What, what do they get out of it? Some of them are not even accessing whatever you have studied. So um, yeah, that and also that I think it's about time to really stop this racialized ideology of Africa just as, you know, 
the southern countries, um, or whatever you call it. Um, so Africa should be Africa as is, and not just one part of it. Thank you. Okay, so I think if I, sh if I should leave you with anything, I would want to leave you with the opportunity to do some deep introspection, because I think ultimately we're talking about relations, um, you know, our positionality to historical relations regarding Africa and Europe. That's the first thing. So what have these relations, relations been, and where am I? You know, how am I constituted? It's an important question to ask. That's the first thing I would say. Secondly, just to add to what Fen Fenny hmm, has um, mentioned, um, my impatience with conferences has also to do with the challenge I have with the heaviness of academia. Academia has really not given much thought and mind to the people on the ground. It has used the people on the ground for its gains. But if you were to ask yourselves, if we were to ask ourselves, um, how practically have we tried to help people on the ground? I'm not sure that we would have immediate answers. So I would also want to add to what Fen Fenny has said in relation to um, academic discourse. I think I will challenge the ECAS conference <laughs> to imagine a very innovative endeavor, I won't want to call it a conference, a very innovative endeavor to actually hear from the folks we like to speak about and then see what we can do with that narrative. Thank you. Star, I do want to give you the opportunity to speak again. Um, well, I was just thinking, um, since we've been talking about knowledge production, uh, and, and part of the reason why Europe dominates, uh, another reason, I mean, many have been mentioned, is also because of resources. Uh, and we know that resources flow from, from the north to the south, and the resources, wh whoever brings resources, they also bring power uh, to, to determine what should be asked, which questions should be asked, you know, so it's also thinking about, thinking about that. So maybe to ask here if, is there a future for African studies? Never mind. Maybe the question should be, uh, is there a contribution that Europe should do? And I'm, I would say yes, they can just give us money. And <laughs> money to do research, uh, but not, not, not control what questions we should be asking, uh, but just, just give the money. Not as a favor, but of course as a, a historical responsibility, um, which, yeah, yeah, because we're talking colonialism here. Yeah. You've witnessed this conversation and we are going to leave with way more questions than we came in with. And ideally, you will take this opportunity to really meditate on these questions. And I think honesty with where we are as individuals, where we are in this system, what privileges we have and how we deal with them and who we also invite to that said party, to that dance floor, as the metaphor was earlier. And why? The honest why, what is the honest intention behind it, I think is a very important question as well. And on, on whom's back are we going to find out those questions? With which outcome, right? For whom, again, those are questions I think that are also interesting. Who's gaining in this? And who's also seeing the benefit of that work at the end in their very own house, in their very own home, in forms of resources, access, chances. Because even this conversation we're having, the fact that we're having it in English, 
is exclusive in itself, right? Um, the fact that we're having it in a very academic bubble is very exclusive, even though people affected um, are mostly outside of this bubble. To so just be also mindful of that, on how we can maybe break all those barriers. And I have not even touched on all the other intersections that we did not even touch upon today. I want to say a very big thank you to my panelists and I would like to invite you to give them a very warm applause. It was, it was a pleasure to have this conversation today and I'm very curious on how that sequel is going to look like in maybe, who knows, Kigali, for example, right? Or even in the West Indies. Have yourselves a very great rest of the conference. I hope you use the time and opportunity to get to know each other, to connect, and yeah, keep on meditating on these questions. Thank you very much.